Hello everyone, konnichiwa from the World Parkinson Congress. It's day four, the very last but not least day of the conference. It has been a full day here and we're just wrapping up. We're about to start the closing ceremony, but I ducked away to the quiet room um, to record this recap video for you for all the things that I learned from day four. So if you're just now tuning in, I am coming to you from Kyoto, and what I'm doing is recapping the World Parkinson Congress workshops, speakers, highlights, and quick tidbits that are actionable uh, that you can Im implement in your Parkinson's journey immediately from home, no matter where you are in the world. So thank you so much for joining us to make this easier for you. Check out the description box below this video and you'll see all the topics I'm about to talk about listed out for you. If you want to skip to a topic, just click the blue hyperlinked timestamp at the beginning of that topic and you'll be taken right to the segment of the video that I talk about um, those type of topics. So you don't have to watch the whole thing. You can fast forward, rewind, but just always remember to like and share with anyone that you think may uh, find benefit from this. So. Um, I had a wonderful day today and we're going to jump right in with topic number one, which was from the very start of day four, which is Friday here, um, Heather Kennedy started us off by talking about the basic requirements for surviving Parkinson's disease. And if, if you haven't heard of Heather Kennedy, she is the blogger Kathleen Kiddo um, and she has young onset Parkinson's and her journey is uh, really inspirational, but she talked about these basic requirements that go beyond um, working out, eating well, and taking your medications. And she boiled down these basic requirements into three categories. The first one being human connection, the second one being creative expression, and the third one being stress management. I'm going to dive into them a little bit, but if you um, follow her, you'll get a, a high dose of all three things. Um, so make sure you check out her blog. We'll make sure to link it in the description box below this video. But as far, excuse me, as far as human connection is concerned, what we've learned, one takeaway here that we've found at the World Parkinson Congress is that if you are someone diagnosed with Parkinson's and you would say that you feel lonely, um, that's actually the single largest predictor of how quickly your Parkinson's symptoms are going to progress. And if you say that you are not lonely, you're significantly less likely to progress that quickly. So um, human connection is a nutrient. Dr. Lori Mishley talked about it. Um, it's been echoing through the halls. And connection may be the most important thing that you can be doing for your Parkinson's symptoms above exercising. You know, Lori Mishley said that if you are exercising six days a week, 30 minutes a day, but you're lonely, it's a wash, which is amazing um, and really impactful. So human connection is important. Take time to make a friend, give a hug, hold hands, um, play with an animal, human touch um, with an animal. Um, you know, all of these things can be really beneficial for your soul. And she also talked about the benefit of human connection is that we can carry each other. You know, she said that she has times when she's on and she can carry those who are off, uh, literally and figuratively, and vice versa. You know, there are days where she just can't do what she needs to do and she has people around her uh, that can carry her and help her get through things. So I just hope that if you hear anything in this video, it's that uh, you need connection and it's a really common thing with Parkinson's to withdraw and to avoid and you couldn't be doing anything worse for your Parkinson's symptoms. So reach out, even if it's commenting on this video, um, if it's joining our free Facebook group, The Invigorated Community, come on in, um, find someone in your area call a friend. Um, it doesn't have to be Parkinson's related. Call a friend, um, go to church, go to the grocery store and talk to the cashier, connect with someone. Um, so that was the first basic requirement of surviving Parkinson's. The second one was creative expression. And you know, I interviewed Kathleen, uh, sorry, I interviewed Heather um, earlier today and we talked about this creative expression and what I've heard from our community from just, you know, subjective conversations with people and also formal research, 
that I did with a research team is there's a large majority of people who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's who lose their ability to create the way they used to, whether it's painting, dancing, um, sculpting, writing, you know, there may have been some creative expression that you had at one point that you feel like you can't do anymore, but it's important to have that outlet. And so Heather said, you know, drag your thoughts into the light, play, dance, listen to music, make music, laugh, um, get your mojo working, and uh, express yourself creatively any way that you possibly can, even if it's not the same as how you used to do it. She then talked about the third basic requirement for surviving Parkinson's being stress management. And she said herself that she's not the best example of stress management. And later in this uh, recap video, I'm gonna talk about anxiety in Parkinson's. So skip to that part if you're interested in uh, managing anxiety. But um, she just talked about breathing. And when you're getting overwhelmed and you're feeling stressed, taking a moment to put your hand on your heart and on your stomach and just take a deep breath. You can do it right now if you want, and it starts to trigger this relaxation response in your body, um, as does laughter and more laughter, as she says. So um, breathing can do a world of wonder for stress. And if you just check in right now and see how loose your chest is and your belly, um, just checking in, being present with your body to melt that stress away. And she closed with her final statement, which was she wants everyone diagnosed with Parkinson's to go out and hunt joy. And this one hit me right in between, you know, the rib cage, hit me real deep in my heart because I think a lot of people have this assumption that some people are positive and handle their diagnoses well or handle life well, and other people just don't have that. And if you're not someone who's positive all the time, can you actually take this approach of, you know, channeling joy and positivity? And she said that it takes effort. You know, you have to hunt joy and you have to look for it in the crevices of everything. And that's actually something you can rewire your brain to do. And we'll talk about that later with the anxiety piece, but you can rewire your brain to hunt joy. So inside of our booster program, for example, we check in every Friday with our group. I tune in and I do a live broadcast to them and I ask them to share a win from the week and something they're grateful for. Uh, we share some other things, but when we start getting in the habit of checking in every day and saying, what was a win today? And what is one thing I can be grateful for? If anything, it can be the ability to breathe. It can be, um, you know, your, that your hands are still attached to your body. Think of all the things your hands can do um, that help you experience the world. Your hands are sacred, you know, and, and thinking like that and finding just the littlest things to be grateful for um, will rewire your brain to find joy and hunt joy on a daily basis. So I really enjoyed Heather's talk um, and I posted on our Facebook page an interview with her today if you want to check out uh, more about Heather. But uh, she's at KathleenKiddo.com. Highly recommend her. She's a beautiful human and um, a wonderful Parkinson's advocate and person in general. So um, our next topic after we... Uh, parted ways with Heather, I attended a uh, session that talked about the what is the best exercise for Parkinson's disease. So we covered three topics. We talked about aerobic training, we talked about um, resistance training, and balance training. So I'll talk about each of them individually. Again, if you want to skip, click in the description. But first of all, it's important to talk about what's the difference between physical activity and exercise. And a lot of you tune in and you say, you know, I do a lot of gardening and I walk my dog, um, so I'm getting my exercise right. And here's the difference between physical activity and exercise, because all exercise is physical activity, but not all physical activity is exercise. So physical activity is moving your body. So you're, you're literally just moving your body. Um, it can be, like I said, gardening. It can be going to the grocery store. It can be taking out the trash. These are physical activities that you're moving your body. But exercise is planned, structured, repetitive, and has a goal of your improving your health and fitness. So this can be swimming. This can be yoga. This can be boxing. 
Tai Chi can be, you know, any of these things. And um, you want to be getting, if you have a Parkinson's diagnosis, you want to be getting exercise. Um, physical activity is good also. It's better than not doing anything at all. But you exercise is the target that really makes a difference when it comes to your Parkinson's symptoms. So that brings me to the three important comp components of aerobic exercise for Parkinson's. And these are, should not be a surprise if you've been following Invigorate, but we talked about intensity of aerobic exercise, frequency, and duration. So how vigorously do you do it, how often, and for how long? And the research supports that um, you want to be doing 60 to 65 percent of your max effort. So really this is exercise where you can talk but you can't sing. So you're out of breath enough that you may be able to say a few words but you can't sing a full song. That's how you know your heart rate is up and you're breathing hard enough for it to be considered moderate intensity. You want to be working out five days a week for at least 30 minutes. And the research supports trying to get a minimum of 150 minutes per week of moderately intense exercise. So some days that may be 20 minutes, some days it may be 40 minutes. Just allocating your 150 minutes of moderately intense exercise every week, that's the minimum to benefit your Parkinson's symptoms. And if you are early on in your diagnosis, the research is showing that aerobic exercise is beneficial during the early and middle stages of the disease. Kind of the most potent time is exercising, starting exercise when you're in the early or middle stages. It's still beneficial when you're in, if you're starting your exercise in the advanced stages of Parkinson's, but you're gonna get more bang for the buck the earlier you start. It's like uh, saving up for retirement. The earlier you start, the more it's gonna um, com uh, com compound over time. I'm not a finance girl, uh, <laughs> but that's uh, the idea around uh, aerobic exercise. Next up, we have resistance training for Parkinson's disease. So resistance training is um, doing something where you're typically lifting weights, um, you know, moving weights against gravity. And the research is showing that high intensity resistance training improves force production after 16 weeks was this uh, research study. So if you're lifting weights, you get stronger and you're able to move weights better. So that's good, um, you know, because getting stronger helps in a variety of ways. You have to have strength in order to have good balance. Um, resistance training doesn't necessarily improve function, functional activity. You know, you could do bench press for uh, and really improve your strength in bench press, but that might not actually help you uh, bend down to pick up your dog, right? There's uh, isolated strength and then there's functional strength, and those are a bit different, but that isolated strength in your hips especially in your core may help carry over into improved balance. So resistance training also helps reduce bradykinesia according to some studies, improves the disease severity. So if you're resistance training, you might feel like your Parkinson's is less intense. Um, and it also helps improve your dynamic stability. So that's also kind of a, a fancy word for balance, functional balance. There have been some studies where you can do lung resistance testing, uh, uh, training, where you have, um, I forget the name of it, but you're, you're training your lungs and you're using um, kind of a mouthpiece that has resistance when you breathe into it to train and out, in and out, to train your diaphragm to get stronger and the muscles around your ribs and it can actually help with your uh, swallowing and your cough force production. So that's pretty cool for those of you who are struggling with um, coughing and swallowing. Resistance training for your lungs might be something that you talk to your uh, respiratory therapist or your uh, speech therapist about that may help you with coughing and swallowing. And then finally, resistance training, just in general, helps increase strength, improve motor function, and improve your mobility. So overall, resistance gets a um, thumbs up as far as a component to include in an exercise program. 
So the third component of exercise that we talked about in this session was balance training for Parkinson's. And there were really three realms of balance training. And this might not be that interesting to you, but when you're talking about building your own Parkinson's exercise program, you wanna make sure that it's well-rounded and you wanna make sure that it's getting the important components that you need. And you may not be a physical therapist, but you can kind of listen to what I'm about to say and go through you know, maybe what you do in your workout classes or your home exercise program to see if maybe you hit some of these targets for your balance program because um, balance training for Parkinson's shows that there's you have long-term improvements in your balance and gait and it also decreases falls. So decreasing falls is one of those really important outcome measures that we look at because falls can lead to kind of have this domino effect, right? If you fall, sometimes you get injured and you can get set back and um, we really wanna prevent falls. That's what we're about in healthcare. If I could boil it down to one thing in physio, um, it's decreasing falls, especially for you guys. So the question came up, what kind of balance training is effective? And there are also three components to effective balance training. The first one is you know, just working your balance. No surprise, I'll expand on that here in a second. Um, working on your stability while you're walking. So how steady are you on your feet should be part of your balance training. And then when you're working in balance, you should also be dual tasking. So doing uh, two things at once, that actually helps you um, Im decrease your risk of falling. It does work on your balance, but it retrains your brain to be able to do multiple things at the same time. So a classic example of dual tasking is being able to look both ways when you cross the street. So you're walking and you're looking and that's and you're processing where the traffic is while you're also walking forward. That's a dual task um, boiled down. But you wanna be able to do two things at once because you might have great balance. You might be able to stand on one foot uh, for a minute, but you can't do two things at once and you might have a fall despite having good static balance. Give me a thumbs up if uh, that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, ask me questions in the comments below and we'll make sure to answer those. But as far as the three components of balance, again, it's balance, balance training. You should be working on balance, gait stability, and dual tasking. So to work on balance, we work on uh, strengthening, building flexibility and posture. We work on kind of reaching outside of your sphere of control. So a lot of falls happen when you're reaching too far forward, you're reaching too far to the side, too far up. So part of your balance training should be kind of reaching outside of your center of gravity to retrieve things in a safe manner, of course. Um, you know, you should be working on going from sitting on the floor to standing up, kind of these, they're called anticipatory postural adjustments, but don't tune me out, I promise. It's just, um, training the part of your brain that helps you initiate movement. So when you walk, you go from two feet to one foot, and that should be part of your balance training. Can you go from two foot to one foot? Can you go from sitting to standing with good balance? Can you go from standing to walking with good balance? That should be part of your balance training. Um, and you should also be walking on various surfaces, so flat, um, uh, rocky, grassy, uneven, um, angled surfaces. That should be part of balance training. Okay, so the second part of balance training is gait stability. And the way you can practice this is to walk at different directions and different speeds, um, turning, walking over obstacles or through a narrow path. Um, those are ways to work on your gait stability. And then to add some dual tasking challenges, you know, this has to do with shifting your attention. And we'll get into details about that um, here in a second. So that brings me to, if you're listening to that and you're, being, and you're kind of thinking like, I may not have the strongest exercise program as far as balance is concerned. The first thing is, um, I'm about to give you ideas to make your Parkinson's balance program more potent. Um, but the key here is that if you feel like you are at risk for falling by challenging yourself during your exercise program, your balance training program, work with a professional first, like a Parkinson's physical therapist or a Parkinson's trainer. 
Um, so you have supervision and then start increasing what you do on your own as you're safe with it. Try not to do some of these things that are unsafe um, because we don't want you falling. I'm gonna turn this um, light down a little bit. It seems to be getting really bright. Okay. Okay, so here are some ideas to make your Parkinson's balance program more potent. Um, you can increase resistance, you can increase movement speed or movement size, so you can go faster, you can be bigger, we talk about that a lot in our online programs. Um, you can go multiple directions, so if you're used to walking forward, try walking sideways, try walking backwards, be careful. Um, try doing some karaoke right and left. Um, you can um, let's see, change the surface. So sometimes if you're really good at standing on one foot on the floor, you can try standing on a pillow. Um, a thin pillow at first, maybe two pillows to increase the challenge. Um, you can also try and do multiple things at once, like walking and counting backwards, um, walking and trying to list off categories. Do you ever play that game in the, or maybe your kids do or your grandkids do where um, it's called categories in the pool and someone calls out a category and they say baseball teams and everyone has to you know think of a baseball team and list it off it's like if you're walking you know how many baseball teams can you name how many states can you name um, how many different fruits how many different vegetables um, those types of things that's a cognitive challenge and that's really really good to practice that's hard for all of us but that's a really good dual tasking challenge and again be careful don't try these things on your own if you have severe freezing because sometimes doing two things at once can trigger your freezing and cause a fall so be careful um, you can also practice carrying things balancing things in your hands you know you can carry a plate with a, a glass on it full of you know water or then full of hot coffee um, and then go outside was an idea. You know, how often do we get outside and really all this stuff is going on outside in the, in the um, community. So take it outside, do obstacle courses, walk on uneven ground or narrow pathways, um, practice getting on and off the escalator or the elevator walk and talk on the phone, walk in a crowd. Um, of course, you know, the, the general rule that I implement when I'm working with someone with balance challenges is I figure out what you're good at and then I figure out how to make it just a little bit harder so that you can succeed, but it's a challenge. And once you've matched that thing, um, that's just a little bit harder, that's your new baseline, we make it a little bit harder. So if your baseline down here is you have trouble walking down your hallway without any stimulation don't go taking it up to the nines by walking in a crowded mall you know kind of increase your challenge as you go someone that I know that I watch from afar his name is Gary Sharp and um, he just does a lot of experimentation with himself and um, does his own exercise program and figures out how to challenge himself and it's actually really cool to watch and so you can do that too start with something that's super easy and then add a little challenge you know if you can walk down the hall pretty good can you walk down the hall and bounce a ball and catch it walk down the hall bounce a ball and catch it um, once you get good at that walk down the hall toss it to the other hand those types of things these are just ways you can start implementing some uh, dual cognitive challenges at home that can be really potent in the long run so that brings me to a quick note about balance training for those with advanced Parkinson's. So what the research is really showing, as I said before, is that exercise is the most beneficial when you start early. So that's why, that's why I'm on the internet talking to you right now is because I hope that when people are diagnosed with Parkinson's, they put in, they type into Google and they say, what do I do now? Uh, now that I have Parkinson's and I hope they find me because I want to tell them from the day they're diagnosed that you need to be exercising but those of you with advanced Parkinson's um, you may be hearing this way down the line and that's okay because exercise is still beneficial for you but for you safety is the most important so you may have um, problems with having falls you might be freezing uh, you might have some issues with cognitive impairment and you can still exercise. It's still critical for you to be exercising, 
but you need to be focusing on um, you know, motor tasks first, so strengthening and balance without all the crazy cognitive challenges at first, and you need to be doing it in a safe environment. So that typically means working out with a professional like a Parkinson's physical therapist or um, you know, someone that you know and trust that can train you and um, keep you safe at the same time. I've had plenty of people who are in your shoes with advanced Parkinson's who, you know, we've gotten to do amazing things after one or two sessions. It just takes a lot more um, safety cueing and supervision um, to get that stuff going. So don't be discouraged, but do be safe. Okay, a few more topics here. We're gonna dive into mood. So we're gonna talk about apathy, anxiety, and depression all in a row. If you wanna skip to a part, again, click in the description box. But we're gonna start with apathy and Parkinson's disease. And I know a lot of you out there struggle with apathy. And apathy does not have a lot of great research, unfortunately, at this point for treatment strategies because it's multidimensional and it changes uh, along the course of your disease. So, but it does happen to about 40% of people diagnosed with Parkinson's. And if you're not familiar with apathy, some of the core symptoms are a reduced interest in life in general, a lack of initiative and participation, uh, lacking perseverance. So you start an exercise program and you just kind of get sidelined and don't get back on it. And then you have some type of flattening of affect. So you just really don't express yourself. And um, the treatment, there are pharmacological, so medications and then kind of non-medication treatment options. and. The results are limited, but um, as far as medications are concerned, dopamine agonists have some positive evidence that they can help with apathy, while antidepressants like SSRIs uh, can actually have actually been shown to uh, have to be related to more severe. More, I gotta start that one over. SSRIs, which are antidepressants. Um, that type of use has been related to more severe apathy in a cohort of about 181 patients. So uh, if you're taking SSRIs, it's really, really common to have more severe apathy than someone who's not taking it that has Parkinson's. So just keep that in mind, and if apathy is really severe for you, it might be time to revisit your um, medication profile with your physician. Never discontinue SSRIs um, on your own. That can be really, really dangerous. So. Uh, make sure you talk to your um, physician about changing any of your medication, especially antidepressants. But when it comes to apathy and non-pharmacological means and treatments, the best thing that's been shown is a combination of exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, and then just adapting your environment to help you be successful. So exercise, what's been in the research is uh, tango, Nordic walking, and physical therapy can all be helpful with apathy. And, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is something I'm going to talk about in the next section, but that's just a way to start retraining your brain and figuring out some of these underlying thoughts um, that might be limiting your participation in your life. So... If you have apathy, just know that you're not alone, or if you're a caregiver watching this because someone that you love is highly apathetic, I hope you find some of that uh, beneficial. But the most important thing is just to get out and get uh, involved in the community. Um, withdrawal is really common, and, um, and unfortunately, withdrawal and loneliness can only compound the problem of apathy and especially depression. Which brings me to anxiety and Parkinson's disease, some different treatment strategies there. So Roseanne Dobkin talked. She's done a variety of research studies and she actually, I wanted to highlight, um, she did a episode, an episode on Parkinson TV on YouTube. Um, the link is in the description below. But she did a talk about anxiety and depression, and she's a wealth of knowledge. So go and watch her talk. Uh, I linked it again in the comment section below. Um, but she talked about different pharmacological and non-pharmacological um, approaches to anxiety. And 
The good news is that anxiety is highly treatable. Um, you do have control. And while you had no choice in your Parkinson's diagnosis, you do have every choice in how you cope with uh, the daily challenges of living with Parkinson's and how you live with um, some of this anxiety. So she talked first about pharmacological interventions, which included antidepressants, those SSRIs. So again, I'm not gonna dive into that because I want you to have that conversation with your physician and don't change your medication without uh, talking to them first. But I did wanna hop into the non-pharmacological treatment methods that she talked about. And the main one that she talked about was psychotherapy and using this type of psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is a treatment strategy that actually is being, being shown to be very effective for anxiety and Parkinson's. And if you haven't heard of CBT therapy before, it targets thoughts and behaviors that cause and maintain anxiety and Parkinson's. And it's, structured, it's a structured and active approach that focuses on concrete coping skills. And you usually do it one-on-one -on -one with a therapist. I am gonna give you some um, things that you can do from home that she shared with us, but you usually do this with a trained professional. And she said that the key anxiety treatment targets um, are helping people get out of this habit of avoiding and withdrawing. Those things can actually exacerbate mood disorders like anxiety. So if you are having the tendency to withdraw from the world, you're actually going to make yourself worse. Um, people also struggle with off anxiety, whether they get more anxious when they're off or they get anxious about being off when they're on. I hope that makes sense. Um, people also have trouble with anticipatory anxiety. Again, whether it's anticipating your off state or you're anticipating a uh, big event, like even going to the grocery store. Maybe you're having anxiety about just being in the grocery store. Um, she also works with helping people develop coping skills and practicing those coping skills and developing a sense of control and empowerment over your Parkinson's symptoms. You might not be able to fully control everything about Parkinson's, but you, there are a lot of things that you can control, especially how you react to things. So um, she, her highlight, her number one thing, your takeaway, if you're listening, what she tells her patients that's really effective is that you should have three goals for every day. Your first goal is to exercise, your second goal is to do something social, and your third goal is to do something pleasurable. Though just doing those three things can tremendously improve your anxiety. Um, exercise has been known to help with anxiety tremendously. Social interaction, again, we talked about that key nutrient, social human connection. So it may feel like counterproductive to you but even if you don't want to go out and see people, you need people. So having an exercise goal, a social goal, and then a pleasurable goal. You know, again, how do you create, how do you find um, pleasure in your day, whether that's um, enjoying your cup of coffee, you know, every morning, really sipping it and enjoying it, whether it's uh, breathing, whether it's looking at a beautiful view or painting or singing, dancing around your kitchen, um, you know, any of those things should uh, be one of your pleasurable goals. She, so those, that's the takeaway, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to expand a little bit, but have a goal, exercise goal, social goal, pleasurable goal. If you hear me, just put those in the comment section below. Exercise, social, and pleasure. Those are your three goals for anxiety. Um, she also said that having a daily schedule and a daily routine is really helpful, and it can include your three goals, but that's actually a really good way to decrease your anxiety in the day. Um, she talked about uh, meditation and relaxation exercises being promising, and then something she talked about that I hadn't heard before was scheduling your worry time. So you may be a worrier, but what she encourages her patients to do is to have two times during the day, 15 minutes each, where you it's your worry time. You're not allowed to worry outside of that time. 
um, your worry time is from 8 a.m. to 8.15 p.m. And then it is again from 6 p.m. to 6.15 p.m. You don't do anything else other than worry during that time. And that's the only time you're allowed to do it. Don't do it outside of it. Only worry during your worry time. So I would love to hear if anybody tries that and uh, what they get out of it. And finally, um, yep, hi there, you're good, um, surprise, they're closing down here, they're ready for me to leave. Okay, and then she talked about self-help. Um, so she mentioned a book that I'll link in the description box below called Mind Over Mood, Changing How You Feel by Changing How You Think by Dennis Greenberger. And again, it's in the, the description box below, but she talked about that being a really helpful self-help book if you do struggle with anxiety. We're almost done, last topic. Depression and Parkinson's disease. Honestly, I didn't get a lot out of this that I can take home to you. He talked about um, a lot of pharmacological antidepressants that are effective for depression. I am not gonna talk about those because I am not a physician and I don't want you to change your medications, but talk to your physician about depression. They will be up to date on um, what's going on in the pharma world. But some things that were mentioned as non-pharmacological interventions included uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, one study has suggested it's almost as effective as Prozac in the treatment of depression, but overall in the research, uh, the study's still out. There's also transcranial electrical stimulation, which has had negative results. So there's magnetic stimulation that's had some positive results, but the electric stimulation um, has had negative results for depression. Psychotherapy did have positive effects, whether it's a group therapy session or it's cognitive behavioral therapy for Parkinson's. So again, cognitive behavioral therapy has been a positive for apathy, anxiety, and depression, all three of those things. So if you struggle from any of these things, go to phys uh, psychologytoday.com and search for a psychologist in your area who's specialized in cognitive behavioral therapy and go see them um, immediately. That's <laughs> great for mood um, and Parkinson's. But back to depression, they also looked at bright light therapy, which sometimes people say, you know, using bright light can help lift your mood and your serotonin. But as far as Parkinson's is concerned, the randomized controlled trial that they uh, talked about today found it did not significantly improve depression. So those were the overviews of the workshops that I went to. I also interviewed three wonderful people. Uh, which are over on our Facebook page, and you can um, head over to invigoratept.com slash Facebook to find all of these interviews. They should be under videos. But I talked to Chad Moore at Dopa Fit Wellness Center, who's doing really amazing things out in Massachusetts. Um, he has two centers there. Go listen to his interview. And uh, also Heather Kennedy, who is the writer of the Kathleen Kiddo blog. I did an interview with her with a surprise visit, visit by Anders Lianis. And I don't know, his, he's from Norway. I don't think I pronounced that correctly. I'm sorry if I butchered it, um, Anders. But he is a Parkinson's filmmaker and also someone diagnosed with Parkinson's. And he won the video competition this year, the uh, WPC video competition, and he has produced a number of, um, it's called the This is Parkinson's um, photographs and exhibits and, and films. So he's wonderful as well and he was on the Facebook Live interviews today. So head over, the, head over to Facebook, check those out, um, show some love to our fellow Parkinson's community. And that is it for me from Kyoto. From day four, it's the end of the conference. We are closing up. Um, if you found this recap or any of the recaps valuable, please like and share them with someone who wasn't able to make it to Kyoto that could benefit from hearing about any of the topics that we covered. Um, you know, I'll scoot over here so that we can put in some um, of our videos from day one, day two, or day three over here so that you can watch those recaps as well. And um, 
also subscribe to our channel and I would be forever grateful. So thank you so much for watching all of these recaps. I hope to be back in three years for the next World Parkinson Congress and um, hopefully I will talk to you soon. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.